unjust war as the war in Vietnam. And we are criminals in that war. We have committed more war crimes almost than any nation in the world. And I'm going to continue to say it. And we won't stop it because of our pride and our arrogance as a nation. But God has a way of even putting nations in their place. And the God that I worship has a way of saying, don't play with me. He has a way of saying, as the God of the Old Testament used to say, the Hebrews, don't play with me, Israel. Don't play with me, Babylon. Be still and know that I'm God. And if you don't stop your reckless course, I'll rise up and break the backbone of your power. Yes. And that can happen to America. Yes. Every now and then I go back and read Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And when I come and look at America, I say to myself, the parallels are frightening. We have perverted the drum mage in, uh, instinct. But let me rush on to my conclusion because I want you to see what Jesus was really saying. What was the answer that Jesus gave these men? It's very interesting. One would have thought that Jesus would have condemned them. One would have thought that Jesus would have said, you are out of your place. You are selfish. Why would you raise such a question? That isn't what Jesus did. He did something altogether different. He, he said in substance, Oh, I see. You want to be first? You want to be great? You want to be important? You want to be significant? Well, you ought to be. If you're going to be my disciple, you must be. But he reordered priorities. And he said, yes, don't give up this instinct. It's a good instinct if you use it right. It's a good instinct if you don't distort it and pervert it. Don't give it up. Keep feeling the need for being important. Keep feeling the need for being first. But I want you to be first in love. I want you to be first in moral excellence. I want you to be first in generosity. That is what I want you to do. And he transformed the situation by giving a new definition of greatness. And you know how he said it? He said, now, brethren, I can't give you greatness. And really, I can't make you first. This is what Jesus said to James and John. You must earn it. True greatness comes not by favoritism, but by fitness. The right hand and the left are not mine to give. They belong to those who are prepared. And so Jesus gave us a new norm of greatness. If you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. That's a new definition of greatness. And this morning, the thing that I like about it, by giving that definition of greatness, it means that everybody can be great. Because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't, know, you don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics in physics to serve. You only need a heart full of grace. 
soul generated by love. And you can be that servant. I know a man, and I just want to talk about him a minute, and maybe you will discover who I'm talking about as I go down the way. Because he was a great one. He just went about serving. He was born in an obscure village. Yes, yes. The child of a poor peasant woman. And then he grew up in still another obscure village where he worked as a carpenter until he was 30 years old. Then for three years, he just got on his feet and he was an itinerant preacher. And he went about doing some things. He didn't have much. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family. He never owned a house. He never went to college. He never visited a big city. He never went 200 miles from where he was born. He did none of the usual things that the world would associate with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only ready to invite the public opinion to turn against him. They called a rabbi out. They turned against him. They called him a rabble rouser. They called him a troublemaker. They said he was an agitator. He practiced civil disobedience. He broke injunctions. And so he was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. And the, 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 the irony of it all is that his friends turned him over to them. One of his closest friends denied him. Another of his friends turned him over to his enemies. And while he was dying, the people who killed him Gamble for his clothing, the only possession that he had in the world. When he was dead, he was buried in a borrowed tomb through the pity of a friend. Nineteen centuries have come and gone. Today, he stands as the most influential figure that ever entered human history. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all parts that ever stood, all kings that ran together, not fed the love of men put together, have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as that one solitary life. His name may be a familiar one. But today I can hear him talking about him. Every now and then, somebody says he's king of kings. Again, I can hear somebody saying he's Lord of Lords. Somewhere else I can hear somebody saying, in Christ there is no east no west. Then they go on and talk about in him there's no north and south but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide world. He didn't have anything. He just went around serving and doing good. This morning, you can be on his right hand and his left hand if you serve. It's the only way in. Every now and then, I guess all the rich how they about that day when we will be victimized with what is life's final common denominator. That's something we call death. We all think about it, and every now and then I think about my own death, and I think about my own funeral, 
And I don't think of it in a morbid sense. And every now and then I ask myself, what is it? But I would want to say, and I leave the word to you this morning. If any of you around, when I have to meet my day, I don't want a long funeral. And if you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them not to talk to you. Every now and then I wonder what I want them to say. Tell them not to mention that I have a Nobel Peace Prize. That isn't important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or four hundred other awards. That's not important. Tell them not to mention where I went to school. I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the wall question. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try in my life to call those who were naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major. Say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all of the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. But I just want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I want to say. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a well song, if I can show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian, or if I can bring salvation to a world once wrought, if I can spread the message as the master taught, then my living will not be in vain. Yes, Jesus, I want to be on your right or your left side, not for any selfish reason. I want to be on your right or your left side, not in terms of some political kingdom or ambition, but I just...